that being the situation we are in, uh, being in this strange state of affairs, it would be it would be interesting to go on with the same theme of the pandemia, but now this one, this webinar, today's webinar, directed specifically at the problem of fieldwork. Uh, so we entitled this fieldwork, this sorry, this webinar, fieldwork in an era of pandemia, digital and other alternatives. So we were thinking of discussing amongst colleagues worldwide what is the situation, what 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 are the alternatives also to this problem. And as I said, since uh, WOW and uh, WCA and IOAS are all international associations, we always aim to have a, a wide range of colleagues from all over the world participating. Last time we had someone from China, we had people from different countries in Europe, we had a colleague from Brazil, we had a colleague from California, and so today we'll have different countries, different colleagues to make more clear how we want to make this a worldwide uh, anthropology, anthropological uh, venture, joint venture. So today we have as guests um, speaking on this theme and I'm going to follow the same logic as last time going from east to west. So first we have our colleague from um, Australia, Pamela McGrath. Then we have our colleague from Japan, Shiaki Kondo. And I hope I'm saying the names all correct. Then we were supposed to have our colleague from India, Nadini Sundar. Unfortunately, she cannot make it because her father is uh, in the hospital. So we hope, we wish he recovers fast. Uh, and we thank Nadini anyway, because uh, she started off being in it in the group, but then unfortunately she had to pull out. And then we will have um, our colleague from um, the UK, Daniel Miller, and then we'll have our colleague from Mexico, Aida Hernandez. So uh, the questions for this discussion, the specific questions that we set out so that we could all think about it were, what technology is there to allow anthropologists to do research and field work when we cannot do face-to-face -face participant observation? What are the advantages and disadvantages of interviewing people online? Should we reconsider armchair anthropology? How could we access unpublished data that we could work on while in a pandemic? And should we reconsider large data sets or surveys? Of course, these are just some of the sub-themes we can consider here. Everyone is more than welcome to bring, on their, bring in their own thoughts, their new ideas about this. So, of course, I thank you all very much for being here, for uh, wanting to participate on this. I think it's important and it's important for WCA and for a while to have this um, worldwide um, webinars, especially in a time where we cannot meet face to face. So we will start with our colleague from Australia, Pamela. Um, so Pam McCross um, is at the Australian National University. She's, she's an adjunct fellow um, with ANUS, National Center for Indigenous Studies, and she has been involved with native title claim research, policy analysis, and the teaching of native, native title anthropology for almost two decades. Afterwards, we will have our colleague from Japan, Shiaki Kondo from Hokkaido University um, and, for, and also from the Center for Ainu and Indigenous Studies at this same university in Japan, of course. His research interests include revitalization of hunting cultures, co-management and resource management issues, and the relations between digital technology and indigenous communities. Then we will have our colleague from the UK, Daniel Miller. I think he's very much known for his work on material culture, but he has also put out um, very recently a very, very interesting video on YouTube on how to conduct ethnography during, uh, and, so, and, and the fact that uh, social interaction is not there. So I think this, directly connects with what we're going to be discussing today. But anyway, Daniel Miller, besides his work on material culture and social media, currently also directs a EU-funded project 
the anthropology of smartphones and smart aging. And his prior ERC funded project entitled Why We Post resulted in a website with over 100 films and stories from the field sites. So I think that's also interesting for the theme that we have here today. Finally, last but not least, we will have our colleague from Mexico, Rosalda Aida Hernandez from the Centro de Investigaciones Estudios Superiores en Antropología Social in Mexico City. She worked as a journalist and her academic work has promoted indigenous and women's rights in Latin, in Latin America. And she has also been working on uh, digital and technological issues directly related with ethnographical research. So thank you very much once again. We will now start with Pamela, please. You have the word. Great, thanks so much, Clara. Uh, and thank you to you and Michelle for convening and for the opportunity to participate. Um, the comments I'm gonna to offer tonight are specifically about um, the challenges of doing applied research uh, with Indigenous Australians for native title, cultural heritage and um, land rights matters. Uh, so this is research that is specifically, there's three features that are particularly um, unique to this kind of research and that, uh, that present particular um, challenges in the context of um, this global pandemic. And so that is that firstly, the research is predominantly place-based um, it involves consultation and research with groups of people, not just individuals. Um, and it's usually conducted under considerable time constraints. Um, and that's because its main drivers, it, it's, uh, this research is done to inform legal proceedings, to, in, um, to um, help facilitate agreement making between Indigenous people and proponents of development. Um, and uh, also used in the context of cultural heritage protection. So um, it's, it's quite a kind of tight, it's quite a tightly um, um, run kind of research. The constraints are quite, um, are quite tight. Uh, in preparation, I've spoken to a number of colleagues who work, uh, that's anthropologists and lawyers who work um, with land councils around Australia. So they're, the community organisations that provide the legal and research service to traditional owners. And then what they're telling me is that um, they're as busy as ever. The work isn't slowing down because of COVID-19 and to make matters worth, worse, they're actually facing funding cuts um, as a result of the, um, very, uh, the impending economic slowdown. Um, so the federal courts continuing with court cases um, with some concessions to social distancing measures such as doing um, um, relaxing of some time frames, some holding of mediations um, and taking of evidence in front of judges via teleconferencing or video conferencing. So there's some con concessions, but overall um, people are having to um. You have to turn on your sound, Pam. You must have touched your sound key. Oh, yes. Okay. How's that? That's fine. <laughs> um, um, and mining and exploration work is also being expedited. Um, uh, well, it's continuing in, but in some instances being expedited. Um, so that work isn't stopping either. Uh, but obviously field research um, in, in with Indigenous um, peoples in these circumstances is very risky to the health of, um, of uh, research collaborators, in particular older collaborators who are cultural custodians. So we need to find a way to do this research, but it needs to be safer. It also needs to be less expensive and it needs to be just as efficient. So it's a pretty challenging situation and um, all round um, colleagues are, are generally um, um, struggling to find ways to, to um, make this research, ha this research happen without compromising the research integrity um, or the um, ethical frameworks in which it happens. Um, 
just quickly a bit of background about where we're at in Australia with COVID. We've been pretty good with flat, flattening our curve um, relatively quickly. Um, there's been just over 7,000 confirmed cases and the 100th um, death was recorded today. Um, and the restrictions are starting to be lifted, um, but it's a bit gently, gently. As far as I'm aware, there hasn't been any outbreaks in Indigenous communities, which is great news. Um, and what I'm hearing is that, in fact, Indigenous communities were among some of the first to move um, when hearing that the pandemic was coming our way. And um, that's in no small part due to the fact that um, there's been um, oral histories have continued to circulate about the devastating impact of the 1919 Spanish flu epidemic that, that um, really devastated a lot of indigenous populations. Um, so some of the specific challenges around doing place-based research um, in a COVID safe way is really how to accurately document the location of significant places, um, which may include archeological sites, how you do that at a distance, particularly in areas where there hasn't been prior research. Um, the custodians of cultural knowledge about sites are usually older people uh, at higher risk of COVID-19. The sites are often located hundreds of kilometres from the nearest town and they require extended field trips to document and locate. Um, and the relevant informants often live uh, far apart and have quite mobile lives and are sometimes quite difficult to track down. So it's not easy work to do at the best of times. Uh, that's five minutes, Clara. Pam, so we will now move to our colleague from Japan, Shiako Kondo, please. Yes. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, you. I, just, just try to speak as loud as you can because uh, it makes a okay. sort of a metallic sound, but we can hear you. No problem. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, I would like to thank the uh, organizers uh, for inviting me to this uh, stimulating event. Uh, it's 10 p.m. Uh, here in Sapporo, Japan, and uh, I'm participating from uh, my apartment and may experience a uh, slow connection uh, since lots of uh, people are using internet in my apartment. So I apologize in the beginning. Uh, if you experience any inconvenience. So uh, I have been uh, working with indigenous hunters uh, in interior Alaska. And since the middle of March, uh, when the COVID-19 cases started to be identified in Alaska, I had conducted uh, two weeks of uh, digital ethnographic research, especially uh, through Facebook. And what I did was uh, very simple uh, because I had to cancel my field trip to Alaska in March uh, due to this pandemic, I decided to stay online as much as possible uh, on Facebook uh, using uh, my iPhone and uh, yeah, and then uh, keeping the uh, chat conversation as some of my uh, Alaskan friends talk to me. And I also saved uh, screenshots of my uh, people's Facebook posts and individually asked uh, for the permission to use it uh, in my research. Uh, before this COVID-19, uh, Facebook was a tool uh, for me to uh, get ready for fieldwork. I had posted uh, on Facebook uh, of my arrival and I get information about who is where uh, during my stay in Alaska. But now I'm, I, I'm thinking of Facebook as a data collection tool. Uh, my initial finding is that my Alaskan uh, friends envision a double social distancing strategy uh, as a way to cope with COVID-19. Uh, the first step is to uh, disconnect uh, the urban areas from the rural communities, uh, emerge commercial flights between urban cities uh, and uh, rural communities uh, seems to have been uh, severely restricted as village or city council talked with the uh, small airplane company uh, serving the community to do so. Uh, another thing uh, people talked about is the possibility uh, of staying uh, in fishing and hunting camp during the pandemic. Some elders uh, posted on Facebook that it might be a good idea to uh, stay away from uh, village and live temporarily in a fishing or hunting camp. Uh, here's uh, one of the posts. 
I hope you guys, uh, you all can see the photos, uh, the screenshots. So uh, here's one of the posts that I saved and received the uh, permission from the elder, uh, Peter Snow, to uh, use it for my research. And he is what he's discussing. It, it might be a good idea for the younger people to stay away from uh, a village and stay in the uh, tropping camp cabin uh, during the pandemic. Okay, so uh, during the uh, chat online, chat-based interview, uh, some of my friends mentioned that in the time of Spanish flu in the late uh, 1910s, they did something similar uh, by uh, staying in hunting and fishing camp to keep distance from uh, non-indigenous persons. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I just asked to uh, think more about uh, Torah digital nature of uh, contemporary indigenous culture where uh, digital technology reshape and redefine uh, what it means to be uh, traditional. So uh, in terms of uh, methodology, of course, uh, I'm not saying that we can forget about offline participant observation and ethnographic interview, but uh, when I can go back to Alaska safely next time, I would like to use a saved a screenshot, like the one that I showed, uh, for photo elicitation uh, interviews. So uh, digital ethnographic research uh, can be combined with offline ethnographic research. Uh, due to the speed of internet connection, I was, unable, I was unable to uh, use, uh, do any video or audio-based interview. I tried to call, but it was too slow to continue a conversation. And in rural Alaskan communities, they use uh, satellite internet services. So. I would like to uh, work with information scientists to uh, understand more about the uh, mechanism of the satellite internet services and see if there's any way to improve the internet connection in rural communities as long as people are willing to do that. Uh, besides my uh, digital field work uh, with my Alaskan friends, uh, I had a chance to uh, introduce a student uh, who lives in Europe uh, to my friends in Japan who practices Shugendo. Uh, which is like a uh, uh, Japanese folk uh, form of uh, Buddhism. Uh, for the student, he was a kind of pilot interview for his research. I usually don't make a call at night for an interview, uh, but the torrent was Zoom drinking party or Zoom nomikai in Japanese. I made it easier for us to contact digitally and casually interview them. So if we didn't encounter this situation, I would have never imagined call my uh, friends in elsewhere in Japan for more than two hours for interview and include a complete stranger who is uh, someone who lives in Spain uh, in our conversation. So this is uh, something new situation that I experienced uh, during the pandemic and that's all for my uh, initial presentation. For your first five minutes. Thank you very much. That was very nice. And, and don't worry, it, there was a little problem, but you solved it. So. You know, we are worlds apart, they're, you know, <laughs> continents apart. So thank you so much, Shiaki. So I will now pass the word to Daniel Miller. Welcome, I give you the floor. Let me. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you for the organizing and also the invitation. Um, just to say also, we've uh, just established a website called anthrocovid.com in which anthropologists from all over the world are giving, uh, in, observations about the response to the pandemic. We have at least 50 already. Um, as uh, I mentioned, I, a couple of weeks ago, made a little video about precisely this problem. And the reason is that we have like a cohort of, you know, PhD students who might want to be going into the field now. And I just felt this is a, a kind of, this is terrible for them. You know, they, they, they got all their expectations and now they can't go. So the question really is, is there a way in which we can still imagine people doing perfectly comprehensive, insightful ethnographies, even if, and we just don't know right now, it turns out that they are never going to be able to get to the field um, during the period of envisaged ethnography. I have no idea how long this is going to last. Um, and the point I want to make is what we're talking about then is not kind of, you know, uh, the ethnography online. It is the idea of an ethnography, um, but done um, online. And I think uh, to do that, 
I was going to make sort of six suggestions of how we kind of, it's almost about attitude that we need to envisage this as a, as a successful uh, possibility. And I think the first thing is to recognize that um, in anthropology, I think it's axiomatic that there is no such thing as a more natural form of communication per se, right? Um, we're not surprised at the moment in our Japanese research that in, in certain cases, people find it easier to express things um, online because of all the constraints and etiquette around face-to-face. -face. Um, and I, I mean, just imagine two people, I don't know, 10 years ago, and uh, sitting there, and one of them gets a phone call. And an hour later, the person turns around and says, gosh, you, you know, you're talking for an hour to your mum and it sounded terrible. I mean, what's your relationship to your mother like in the real world? Well, like nobody would have said that because we accept the telephone now as real. And principle number one is online is the real world. That's what it is. That's where we are. And we can, I think, be, be comfortable with that. Um, principle number two is that um, we, we don't have online versus offline here. We've always had a great range of contexts. Um, we have uh, the difference offline between going to somebody in their workplace and having dinner with them at home. So now, sure, you have a difference between uh, being on WhatsApp with somebody or Line as opposed to um, watching what they could create on, on TikTok. And as in any anthropology, we are able to compare the different kind of contexts. Obviously, I am talking about circumstances where people have relative um, internet accessibility um, and use, but that now is common for, for much of the world. Um, then I think the third thing is, I don't think of this as having to do interviews. I think the key is to understand that it is simply participant observation as we have always understood it. That is to say, um, you will have exactly the same issues of, of long-term participation, getting active, helping people look after their kids online, whatever it is, gaining trust, gaining friendship, developing a, a whole field of relationships over a long period of time. And that is now possible in many instances um, online. Um, the fourth thing I would like to say is that the, one of the books we did recently, How the World Changed Social Media, is about the cultural relativism of online. That every population does this differently as they would offline. And the implication of that is the anthropological study of the specificities of those cultures is just as possible through online communication and comparison as it would have been in offline. Fifthly, I think there is also an additional resource here that to some extent compensates for the loss of not actually being in the field, and that is the use and interpretation of this visual material. Because if you like, what's happened in human conversation is we, you know, we had oral, we had textual, now we have visual. And actually having a sensibility around you know, the memes and the images and the analysis of this material um, gives you uh, a great all sorts of possibilities for analysis and insight that we might not previously have had, and it is there online. But the last thing I'd say is this, which is we're not actually just talking about doing things online. We are also talking about doing this because of the pandemic, because of the pandemic. And therefore, it seems to me that all of us also need that particular sensitivity, that we are going to be dealing with people who may well be in conditions of claustrophobia or depression um, and all sorts of the other kind of deficits they suffer from. And it seems to me we also therefore need to be talking about um, how we remain sensitive to the very specific condition in which the people we are dealing with may be living under at this particular moment. And um, that's my thoughts. Thank you so much, Daniel. Well, this was the first round of, uh, of oh. comments and we still have Ida. Yes, we still have Ida. No, I didn't forget you. I didn't forget you. So now we have Mexico. Welcome, Ida, please. 
Well, thank you very much. I just want to begin by saying that uh, when uh, um, Clara introduced me as also being a digital anthropologist, I almost laughed because I know that some of my friends are looking at this and I'm one of the most uh, 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 illiterate digital person. So I'm talking here, uh, I don't even have Facebook. I don't have a Facebook, I'm a journalist, but I'm a very traditional, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, a PhD professor, and also a journalist, but a very traditional journalist. I, I do not have a Facebook for safety reasons. So I think that it's uh, interesting that you can hear another perspective from women that are entering into the field. And I work with people, uh, I do, um, prison anthropology, I work with people in prisons that do not have access to internet or even cellular phones. So how to be creative when you have this kind of work? So I think that I can also approach. And with the first question, of course, the first answer was to use the internet um, and the concept of digital ethnography or just ethnography, as Daniel Miller said, comes to mind. The first thing we did in the PhD program where I teach is to include a methodology class in digital ethnography in the syllabus. Uh, since the pandemic started, we started to change the syllabus to include this. And I think I should take that course because I'm not the one that it's teaching. This is a new generation of younger scholars at Chiaki who are uh, very excited about the digital ethnography. But I think that we also need to be more creative to be able to continue working with sectors of the population that do not have access to internet as the inmates in the penitentiary system, as immigrants in detention centers, or even as rural and indigenous people in communities in isolated areas that do not have access to internet. And first I want to complicate the question by adding what are the challenge for activist research when you cannot do face-to-face -face participant observation? And uh, at this respect, I would like to share my own experience working with women in Mexican prisons as an activist researcher. The first step was to get information through their families about the health conditions of the inmates and the health measures being taken by the authorities. The information allowed me to document that the prisons were not uh, following the recommendations of the Ministry of Health about social distancing, sanitary measures. The overpopulation of prisons made it impossible the social distancing in a cell where 15 women have to share an 11 by five feet room and to constantly wash their hands when they have a water shortage and 70% of the women prisons in Mexico do not have water in their cells. Um, so with these conditions, we uh, find out that some fundamentalist religious groups uh, were entering into the prisons during the uh, pandemia and they were allowed to do so. So we called the authorities and they told us they are doing that under their own risk. And they were not saying anything about the risk that represents for the inmates. So then I decided to enter into contact with other uh, scholars that are working uh, in prison settings and also uh, with uh, activists that work for prison uh, rights and we start a campaign, uh, a national campaign for amnesty for those people in prisons for not violent crimes. Women that were pregnant, inmates over 60s, and also women that were in prisons for abortion reasons, because in Mexico, abortion is prohibited. Um, and uh, as a public intellectual, I start to write about it in the national newspaper that is called La Jornada. Under the pressure, of this campaign and also in alliance we did lobby by phone with some senators that are progressive. One of them is an, the first indigenous senator that we have in the Congress who was in prison and I was part of the expert witness team that got her freedom. She was in prison for being part of a, a indigenous um, justice system. So I'm very close to her and she was able to help me to push the lobby and finally uh, three weeks ago, a, week, a month after the pandemia, we were able to get the amnesty for some of these, uh, uh, of these inmates. We know that similar efforts are done in USA, where a team based, uh, uh, based in UCLA, in the law school, started a project called COVID-19 Behind Bars Data Project. 
and is making pressure to review files and ask for the release of vulnerable inmates. Uh, this is the, the activist part, but at the same time, uh, I also contact uh, families with whom I have previously had contact because I have been working in this activist research project about a judicial racism for many years. So I know a lot of the networks of the inmates outside. So through their families um, uh, that I have contact before, we send them a clean artisan notebook that we call an empty book because the project that I work with is a project of appropriation of creative writing by the inmates. And we also do artists and books with them. So we send them an empty book and we uh, um, send them also a series of topics to reflect about in their diaries. They could decide in the future if they want to share their writing in a collective workshop or uh, if they allow me to use part of their journal for public publication in, the, in a web page that we already have created with some young scholars to denounce what is going on in the prisons. And, uh, or if they just want to keep it for themselves as a tool of self-reflection during the quarantine. Because uh, after the amnesty, there are new measures being taken and they are not able to use like the common space right now only for eating, taking social distance. Uh, the use of journals or diaries have been common as a social science research methodology. Uh, they have many books published about how to use a diary. Uh, Andy Alzaweski has reflected on this methodology in his book on their diaries for social research. Uh, and from the health science, Ruth Barlett and Catherine Milligan have also explored the use of journals. Uh, through their experience with people with mental illness in their book, What is a Diary Method? So we are specialists in diaries with our field work, uh, field work uh, notebooks also. Um, but I want to clarify that this kind of methods require a previous relationship of confidence that the activist research creates in which the social actors assume that the sharing of their reflections around different issues Will not be only will not be only to advance the academic career of the scholar, but also to give input for a shared project of social justice. There are uh, also many other data sources that we can access through the internet to put into context the written text of these diaries. In our case, the emerographic research has been basic to understand the challenge that the prison systems and the inmates are facing in this specific historical moment. We are also starting a new collective project about extreme and structural violences in the state of Guerrero. That is a Mexican state that has been deeply affected where, by militarization, by the organized crime in the context of the so-called war on drugs. And in the context of this pandemic and the impossibility of doing field work, we're starting a collective database. And I'm learning to use this. Lola Figueroa is now connected. I saw her name. So we are starting to learn with this new generation how to create a collective database in which all of us can have input. Um, and we are also uh, something else that I think it's important for some of our PhD students that uh, have done a master thesis before I have done field work during their master thesis, and that is to go back to your uh, field notes and to read them with a different perspective, to reread the content of your old field notes with new questions. And, um, and also uh, making our field notes, in the case of our collective project, making some of our field notes available to the other researchers. In the case of the new project that we are beginning, we are around 10 uh, researchers that have worked in the state of Guerrero. We all have previous field work in the area in different issues of violence. So we're, what we're going to do with the database is that we are going to enter part of the information that we already have to share it with the rest of the team. And I think that this is very important for different reasons. Also because is it creates an academic community in a moment in which we need to build communities. And it, 
It's a way also to confront this neoliberal academia that is promoting the individual careers and including each other to compete. So in the time of pandemia, to build knowledge in the community, uh, it's a need because we need to look for new strategies, but it's also a way to build an emotional community in which we can support each other with, through different generations, the new scholars that are entering to the field with the senior scholars as myself, to confront the new context in which we have to do research. And just to close, there is a huge debate that I'm not gonna give here about what is activist anthropology, but it has been a lot in the Mexican context and in other contexts, a very positivist perspective that disqualify active research uh, for not being scientific enough. And I think that this pandemic put into the center of the debate because on one hand, people are not going to allow you what Daniel Miller was suggesting to stay through the uh, screen seeing their life if they don't have a conviction that what you, what you are gonna do is gonna help them for some kind of social justice. So it's not just like uh, a decision that we take because we are good people. It's a demand that the social actors have that what we do can contribute in a certain way to their social justice projects. So to be able to have their diaries, their journals, to enter into their intimate space through the camera, we need to make our projects relevant to their social reality they are living. Thank you very much. Besides those questions that actually some of you addressed now, um, the fact that doing digital anthropology, we also have to build on all those uh, themes and all those uh, interactions of confidence, intimacy, and all the ethics that are concerned uh, that, that are part of that. I think most people, I've been reading the questions and the comments that people have been posting on the chat on the side. And of course, uh, there are some issues that come up very strongly. And, uh, and actually, it's very interesting because they relate to some of the issues that came up in our first webinar, which was entitled Culture and Public Health in the Era of Coronavirus, which is the matter, the issue of inequalities. We are, we cannot, as anthropologists and as citizens of the world, assume that everyone has access to internet. Some people might even have the computers, might even have the tools, but they will have no connection. They cannot pay the bills and not even talking. I mean, if you add to this all the situations like the ones Ida spoke about, people who are in jail, but people, imagine the refugees uh, or people who live like in Alaska or in um, reserves for Aboriginal um, natives that have no access to internet so this definitely that what we're discussing here today really brings up again this issue of inequalities people around the world are not don't have the same access to well unfortunately they don't have the same access to health uh, to housing and they do not for sure have the same access to internet and to well social media as a social media as a whole so this is i think one of the main issues that has been brought up on the chat um and i uh, me I, I totally agree this is probably one of the of the most complicated challenges that we face because we can very well do all this uh digital ethnography with different with populations that with communities with people that have access to it but not to others not with others and the second issue that comes up in the chat that i've been uh, looking at here is uh, students asking okay but how do we reformulate imagine we are indeed we have a research project uh, that is going into somewhere where you cannot really do it without being there and sometimes they can just not reformulate it it's not an option so these are, I think, two issues that I would like our, our participants to address. Um, or even now, you know, you can either address these two main issues or you can call back to uh, some of the things that the colleagues uh, just discussed. Uh, uh, look, just on that issue of um, inequity of access to technologies, um, that's really uh, 
it's a significant issue when convening um, consultation and decision making processes that research and help inform um, that, you know, that can really shift the power balance um, between um, parties and between different groups of people. Uh, and it's one of the real risks that needs to be managed as um, new, new communication technologies are being rolled out. Uh, what some land councils are doing, and in fact, I suspect all of them will be doing, is investing some of the savings from the reduction in travel costs and um, um, associated with doing remote field work and meetings and reinvesting that into um, technologies and um, upskilling um, of, the skilling of people to um, utilise those technologies. And that includes researchers as well as um, research collaborators. Um, so that's, an, I think that's a really um, key issue that's on everyone's mind as we move forward um, with that. Kind of returning to the question of what are the options for um, trying to do, do place-based um, um, field research and meet, meetings at the moment. So there have been some video conferencing trial by some of the land councils um, involving large meetings. Um, uh, that using Zoom or Microsoft Teams, um, they've uh, that's happened in both remote community settings and also in urban-based settings, and that is in a large part part enabled through the fact that in actually um, a lot of remote communities do have really great um, Wi-Fi access now. There's been a whole rollout of um, of um, Wi-Fi towers and phone towers and the like. Most people have mobile phones, so um, um, that's uh, so that they're, they're possible, but they are, there's issues with sound quality, translation, um, facilitation of meetings is really um, tough in those circumstances, particularly if you can't, um, if, if you can't get a facilitator in there and it's uh, facilitating remotely. Um, they're taking a lot more time. Um, so a half day meeting is taking two days to facilitate. Um, in order to really um, ensure that there's um, robust decision making and consensus raised by everyone involved. Finding suitable venues is difficult, that enables um, social distancing. Um, but they are finding that video conferencing is possible. It's not ideal, but it's possible at the moment. And they've very little choice really um, in the circumstances. Um, GIS mapping tools are really something that um, I think are underutilised in the kind of applied work that we do and upskilling of both researchers and research collaborators in the use of GSI tools I think are going to be really useful for um, mapping, um, trying to map at a distance or even, um, you know, like sharing of mapping of um, survey outcomes if fewer pe only fewer people can go out. Um, so there's online portals, um, online portals that can be used on um, shared screens that you can really zoom into the details, you can add different layers of information on top. There's some fantastic tools, um, but again, it requires an investment um, to ensure that um, everyone can um, participate in the technology. Uh, GoPro cameras, maybe sending fewer people out to do work, but using video, you know, per, GoPro cameras so that their experience is recorded almost like with a first person view and that can be later shared and interrogated with um, both researchers and traditional owners. Really important to ensure that there's recording facilities um, for any online interviews. Um, it's really essential for accountability and review and record keeping. Um, and I just would like to point everyone to a resource that's available online that's been produced by a sociologist called Deborah Lup um, Lupton from the University of New South Wales. It's called Doing Fieldwork in a Pandemic uh, and it's a crowdsourced document that she's edited that's got some really comprehensive and, and fantastic um, information about um, the different um, different possible ethnographic methods. Um, unfortunately, really not many that are uh, that are useful to the challenge of place-based research or group group work, but worth checking out anyway. Um, so the online the online um, 
using online um, technologies such as video conferencing, some of the positives are that other than in addition to completely eliminating the risk of participants contracting um, COVID-19, they are, it is significantly cheaper. Um, it's got the potential to increase participation and reduce um, the consultation and research burden, um, uh, research fatigue for participants because they don't have to take as much time out of their life to participate. Um, so they're all real positives, but there's also quite a few negatives. Um, in, it, in addition to the technological inequities, um, processes can take longer. Um, the limited numbers that we're experiencing today, you hit the cup of 300 and that's it. Um, and Deborah Lupton has actually done a brief, brief review of the literature, which shows that, um, that shows it's optimal to cap focus group meetings or group meetings at six participants um, if you want everyone to be able to participate. Unfortunately, the kind of meetings that are required usually involve um, at least 10, sometimes scores or hundreds of people. So, um, you know, that's kind of going to compromise. Um, it's a compromise on the method. Um, and it's also harder to keep people in the room. So um, parties can more easily withdraw from a process if they're feeling aggrieved. Uh, it's harder to get them back in a virtual room than it is if you're actually in a face-to-face -face meeting. So that's particularly for researchers who are working on mediation and dispute resolution processes. And of course, um, for hearing or vision impaired individuals, um, um, yeah, online, um, online, options are sometimes alienating. So I'm not sure what that's at. Where am I at with my time? Five minutes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pam. Actually listening to you and just the, the final uh, part of what you just said, I was just uh, relating to what Luis Fogo, I think, wrote here on the chat that he works with people with disabilities and those people with disabilities are not able to use uh, the social media and the internet tools as other people do. So that's also a problem. So in fact, um, I think that when we talk here about inequalities and somebody else, Thomas mentioned, we should have a webinar on this definitely. But the problem is inequalities. It's such, unfortunately, such a huge word with such a huge meaning uh, that in these two webinars that have been directed to the pandemic specifically, we address, we've been addressing different types of inequalities. In the first one, I remember we spoke a lot about uh, inequalities uh, in, in, in the face of the pandemic, like people who are stranded at home, women that are uh, being abused, uh, domestic violence, this type of uh, refugees. So different inequalities in face of the virus and of the pandemic situation and today we are trying to address inequalities as far as you know being able to do this work online and having as you just said and like Luis Jojo mentioned people who whom we cannot get through through internet because they cannot have internet they cannot use or they don't have the means so these inequalities are also uh, there and we have to address them and try to find solutions as anthropologists. So I will now pass the word to uh, Shiaki. Okay, thank you. Uh, speaking of inequalities, uh, I also encountered the uh, importance of digital divide, where I know a very good detail of people's activities uh, for some people, but for the other people, I have no idea. You know, some people just posted about going fishing, fish camping, uh, uh, fish camp for a while, and they uh, disappeared for uh, weeks. I assumed that he was, uh, he went camping, but he actually went to mining camp for work. So I sometimes lost track of them because of uh, some people have uh, good access to the internet, while other people uh, do not. And uh, also, but before the uh, pandemic, that the school library had the internet access, so everybody could, uh, everybody was able to be online. But the, because the uh, school library is not, uh, uh, cannot be used anymore, so that the people who have are paying for the satellite internet service can go online. So this is definitely the, the situation that the social distancing uh, 
causes the uh, make that uh, uh, digital divide deeper. And uh, as for my uh, collaboration uh, with international colleagues, I think that the time difference is also very uh, important in that when I uh, talked with my Japanese friend who is practicing Shugendo, uh, it was actually asked by my uh, colleague in Canada to introduce uh, his student, a prospective student who is living in Spain. So like we are working uh, among three uh, different time zones. And so uh, still time difference is very uh, difficult, but still uh, we have, it, it is very important for us to uh, have international partners, uh, the importance of counterparts are much more uh, stressed nowadays because we, uh, yeah, because it's sometimes very uh, difficult to uh, adjust the time zone. And as I'm experienced right now, it's uh, 11 p.m. almost here in Japan. And in Japan, uh, digital technology, uh, digital ethnography is not really uh, discussed or uh, taught in uh, academia yet. So I, as a I'm now an assistant professor, but as a graduate student, I never received any training about uh, digital ethnography and this kind of uh, research method. So I think I'm very interested in learning more about the experience other people have uh, done and so on. Thank you very much. I pass the word to Daniel. Daniel? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I mean, I think that one of the things one cannot even pretend one can do is provide internet access for people who don't have them. And this webinar includes, I think three of the speakers are talking largely about people where there, there are significant constraints and it seems to be entirely appropriate that we are addressing those. Um, but at the same time, um, I think it would be strange to ignore that for most anthropologists working in most situations in the world today, um, they will be working with people who actually do have is an access, but they still have very significant problems in having to somehow transform the, the uh, ethnographies they had planned into this online. And I think it's also entirely reasonable um, to address those kind of issues. And I think that um, one also wants to be aware of just how widespread different kind of access is. I mean, my current project, um, we have ethnographies going on with migrants who are often amongst the, the major users of online precisely because they are migrants. We have work going on in Cameroon. The project in Uganda is in a very, very low income. Uh, what you might consider a slum, you know, mud houses, basically. Um, but people, not, not only they, is there a smartphone access, but actually, if you look at the transformations around the, the most important issues of poverty there are often, how do you support elderly people back in their villages um, from the people in the town? And it's all mobile money um, in this area of Africa today. And you, you would not understand inequality and you would not understand poverty and you would not understand any of these issues if you are not involved, not just in the question of how we gain online access, but the fact that they are using online all the time. And that's why I think this, you know, the research that we're doing is in many ways so relevant. So we also have to respect the resourcefulness of our informants, the way even those with difficulties and um, have ways of actually trying to gain, gain access and do gain access and we need to learn from that. A lot of our project is about is about essentially respecting the creativity of users in this world, okay? I mean that's one of the key things to me about the inequality is not to assume it's just about you know what do we do, how do we use it, but if you go out there and you go online you will see extraordinary activity going on for people with the you know who, who really cannot afford a, a full day's worth of access you know every they, they have to turn off everything because every single message is a cost to them but they are engaged most people are engaged and i think we uh if we were working those communities um we would want to understand respect and convey um that experience in our work and that is really what we, we're trying to do and I think one of the points I make, as I mentioned at the beginning of my earlier talk, that we have this uh, website called anthrocovid.com. And, um, and in a way, I was talking about speculatively. What, what would you do if you had to start your fieldwork now? 
this uh, website is more for people who had already uh, actually carried out ethnography or had uh, a relationship particular area and are following the response to the pandemic. And I'm sure there's over 50 responses there and they are fascinating. And they actually show the, the sheer diversity of uh, practices in the, these conditions. You know, whether it's a, a DJ, we have somebody talking about a monastery, um, conditions where you might not have expected these kinds of online interactions going on. But the people we are studying, under the, they're suffering from exactly the same problem we're discussing here, right? It's not just us who are having to go online, they're having to go online. And if you look at what's on that website and you see, yes, sometimes it's people who are, who are getting very lonely and very depressed and have issues of police brutality and all the other issues that we are familiar with um, do, as a direct engagement because they can't go out for work. They can't get, um, they're not, the government's not giving food um, to them, et cetera, et cetera. But they are telling us about this online and we are trying to respect those voices through the online ethnography we do. So I think that um, we, we're talking about our challenges but they are the mirror image of the challenges that we will be studying if we engage with those populations online. And the final point is this, that um, people are talking about, well, issues of trust. I mean, what, what does it mean when you have build a relationship? Um, but my point would be that um, that is essential in any kind of ethnographic encounter. That's why we do it often for 16 months and not six days. Um, you, this is a gradual process and it involves constant discussion and negotiation and learning sensitivities to the people we work with as they also learn about us and what we are trying to do for them and with them. That would be true online, but it has always been true offline, and we should be learning from those experiences and transforming it um, into this new environment, because of course it remains an issue. There will be differences in the way that operates, but, um, but those issues continue to, uh, and we have lots of experience and much that we have learned uh, about how we deal with those in the long-term experience of ethnographic practice, um, and that's something for the people who are just starting now. This is not going to happen overnight, but ethnography never did. Um, we mainly work with a 16-month time frame, and there's a reason for that. And um, that would be my expectation of how online work would go. And I've no idea how much longer I've taken, but it's probably five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, Ida, please. Hello. Well, uh, first I want to say, well, and we anthropologists are always overcritical, but I was a little bit surprised that the questions that were sent were all like technical questions, like namely that the communication to do fieldwork was a technical issue. And some of the, I think Thomas, Thomas something, point out that Facebook is a corporation. And I think that there is also an issue of power. Of how do we use this new framework? One of the reasons why I do, I do not use Facebook, among others, is that I have been involved in different expert witness reports uh, against the military and linked to paramilitary groups. And my safety and my family's safety was challenged and I cannot open, even when I know there are restrictions, well, the issue is that I think that if we are going to enter more and more into the digital world, we have to look for alternative spaces outside the corporations. We have to include in our syllabus when we are teaching digital ethnography, how can we uh, use safety uh, measures in the way we use these digital ethnographies? I think that all those issues of uh, power and inequality that will frame the new scene for ethnography uh, have to be included, not just as a, a technical issue, but as a power reflection of how, what it means uh, to do uh, fieldwork in this new frame. But because there were some, some technical questions that I want to address, but also to link to these reflections. One of the questions, one is the same thing to, to do, uh, what the advantage or disadvantage of doing in, uh, interviewing online? Are we gonna become armchair anthropologists? How are we gonna go back to the, um, to the more systemic, uh, what was the, 
the, the, the work that they used, well, to more broader analysis instead of doing uh, more case studies, there were some of the technical questions were there. And um, as, as we have said, they interviewing depends a lot of the trust that we have to build. And how do we build trust through the internet will mean other kind of strategies before we're thinking going directly to interviews. In the case, because we're thinking, at two levels. What is What are we going to do now with the students that are going to the field? What are we going to recommend? And the other thing is, how is anthropology going to change? We don't know what will be the future of field work in general. But uh, I think that in a more practical terms right now, uh, the issue of with our students, I think that it will be a lot easier to start with institutional interviews uh, uh, before they go more directly with social actors because they have to build that relationship with more time in order to use this. And I feel kind of uncomfortable with the question of, are we going to become armchair anthropologists? That was one of the questions. With the use of what is armchair anthropology? And uh, as uh, Daniel said before, after all, what we do as an anthropologist has to do with human communication that is basic in anthropology. And human communications can take many, many forms. So I don't think that uh, it depends what you mean by armchairs, but our ethnographic gaze will be always be a contribution to other social science. And I think that we should keep this ethnographic gaze uh, that we can achieve uh, through all different uh, methodological strategies. And we can also do an ethnographic readings of the archives. I think that that's something that is not the same reading that a, a, a historian will do. How can we take ethnography to review files, to review um, historical documents, emerographical data, governmental reports from an ethnographic perspective that can allow us to read not only the discourses, but also to read the silence in those files that we are accessing to. Uh, to complement uh, and, and to put this uh, kind of data into a cultural and political context. Uh, I think that our, that's something that we have to remember is that to do ethnography has also to, uh, a lot to do with the thick description that Clifford had, had uh, re uh, written about and how can we get this de thick description, having a different reading of documents and doing an ethnography of those files. In Latin America, people that are working in human rights have written about what is doing ethnography of human rights files, what it means, how do we address this. In summary, to use our training on cultural deconstruction to approach the different archives as cultural objects. We can also use the tool of visual anthropology, for example, to request our co-researchers in an activist research to videotape and to discuss together this kind of videotapes. Um, and I think that, uh, as I said before, a lot of those challenges will have a different frame if the kind of co-production of knowledge is, uh, it has meaning for the people we're working with. Uh, see, we are, uh, discussing the project together with the social actors with whom we work and it is clear why it's important to do this kind of research. It is a lot easier for them to get a, a camera and do documentary film that we can use uh, together. Uh, and in, in, um, in the same case, one of the questions, how to have access to unpublished documents, for example, was one of the documents. And I, as I said before, the importance of collaborative research in activist anthropology uh, uh, has given us the possibility, for example, to have access to uh, digital archives of human rights organizations with whom we work. That's the case of this huge project that I was describing before that we are starting. Uh, the pandemic has shown us how the structural inequalities created by patriarchal capitalism and colonial legacies has deepened the impact of uh, coronavirus in racialized poor communities in the world, making urgent and anthropological research committed with social justice and the co-production of knowledge through methodologies that include the concerns of social actors. But 
This activist alliance in the production of knowledge allow us to have access to certain sources of information that we would not have access from a positive distant research agenda that also takes into consideration the theoretical concerns of the researchers. Why a human rights organization will share with you a digital data because you want to theorize about legal pluralism. They don't care if your theory is very clear or not, if they don't see clearly how the access that you will have to their database will not jeopardize the work or will not contribute to the kind of work they are doing. Uh, this is the case of the collaborative research that I told you before about structural and extreme violence with a, a human rights organization of Plachinola, with whom we started uh, this project on rational, uh, racialized violences in, in the area. Part of the commitment of this research is to help them to organize the database of human rights violations of the last 10 years. With their trust and help, we uh, are seeing the possibility of have access to their digital reports uh, that are not, are not open to the public. But this will mean a lot of ethical issues that we have to discuss together, a lot of safety issues that we have to discuss together. And in order to be able to enter into the digital archives, uh, uh, it, it has to be very clear what the final product of this database would be, and what it has to do with their social justice project. Um, uh, and in the case of the government files on the subjects of human rights, for example, we could request access to the information that is not open to the public through it. In the case of Mexico, there is a transparency law that uh, if they do not want to allow you to enter into their files, you can uh, file a request through the transparency law. And we are using these kind of uh, access tools to have uh, to do that. And uh, so they were concerned in this qu questionnaire of, uh, if we reconsider to go back to large data sets or survey. And I think that these methodologies have always been used in support to the field work strategies in anthropology, and they should continue to be used. But we have to search for more creative methodologies to have a deeper approach to the voices and experiences of the social actors with whom we work. That's the ethnographic gaze that I was talking about. The contribution of anthropology uh, can make these more sociological tools by putting into the center the thick description and uh, that we can achieve through different qualitative methods, collaborative documentary film, focus groups. That's another tool that we can use when we have built this trust. How can we do focus groups uh, 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 through the through internet? Um, and uh, each of these uh, tools are only tools. What anthropology can give is our uh, ethnographic gaze, our, our cultural perspective contextualizing all those cultural objects in the broader networks of power and culture in which they develop. And I think that, um, that that is something that it doesn't matter how communication takes place, we can continue contributing to a more complex analysis of reality through the kind of training that we have in which power and culture are always in the center. Thank you. Okay, Ida, thank you very much. Uh, I've been, um, while you were talking, I've been checking the chat. So basically the questions that continue, continuously come up are of course the ones that have to do with inequalities of access, of use of internet and not only the problem of internet corporations which you've some of you already addressed and some of the students are asking about ethical uh, problems of using uh, other uh, of using internet uh, and other media so we we basically have this this issues that either just uh, just addressed but i would um, i would now ask uh, the participants who wants to to go ahead and, and uh, address some more of this um, particular issues that have come up in the chat. Um, it doesn't have to be in the same order. I just saw that, for instance, Liza Stefan uh, uh, in the chat mentioned how uh, research participants and collaborators, how it is important that decisions about technologies from diaries to Zooms, 
are made together with the people we are researching. So, uh, and this of course has to do directly with ethics. So I don't know who, I think Daniel made the sign he wanted to go and yeah. uh, so I'll give you the yeah, word. I, I very much agree with that statement. I mean, I think there's, there's all sorts of ethics to do with compliance and to do with concerns over inequality, but I think fundamental here, um, it's to me, it's about sensitivity. So, and, and the sensitivity comes from uh, expanding what I was trying to say before. We, it's not that we're going on Zoom and we're going on Skype. The starting point has to be to learn what the population you are working with understand by those mediums. These mediums are created by their users in practices. And I think different populations use them differently and the grow, getting sensitive to what they mean by them. What do they understand as privacy? What do they understand as harm? What does they understand as the developing etiquette of what is appropriate and inappropriate ways to use these media that you are conversing with? That's what we would have done if we were there working with um, conversation and other forms of uh, interactivity. I still think it applies online. And for me, that is fundamental ethics. It's essentially about retaining our sensitivity, not losing it just because we're transferring into online rather than offline situations. Thank you, Daniel. Anyone else wants to address this uh, issues? Uh, yes, just uh, I just guess I just observed that that yes, there's a wicked problem there about the fact that consultation is required in order to kind of develop and endorse new approaches to um, doing um, field research. But, you know, but then how do you do that consultation in the first instance, you know, and that's, that's, um, I just don't know how we kind of think our way out of that one. Um, yeah. One one comment that just came up on the chat, I don't know if you all can see it, but uh, Leonardo Stavis mentioned, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how we can analyze critically what we can't observe or experience directly, which I think ties into what we were just discussing, how to make things happen together with the people we are researching. Um. I guess I'm going to say the same thing about maybe too many times, but the only point I'd make is learn from our previous experiences. We never had access to everything that was going on in people's lives. Um, we were always extrapolating from the encounters that we could have to the encounters that we couldn't have. There were always, as it were, externalities to, to research. This is not a, a specific phenomena to, to online research. And I think it is something we have always discussed and always had to do. And I think we're not, we, my point is don't reinvent wheels. Um, we actually should be contemplating what we have learned from those problems of extrapolation in the past and applying them to these domains. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I think something else that has come up a lot uh, in the chat from students is uh, this issue of how to solve the problem that they cannot shift research projects and um, what should they do if they really can't do it um, and and if they cannot access through the internet if they cannot do the field work that we're discussing here well um in the case of our phd program uh, we have a master in a phd program in mexico and the students supposed to start their field work in june uh, in august and so they are with this dilemma. They have the project and they don't know if they will be able to build. I think that in that sense, it is so important to have a close communication with your dissertation advisor to go back to your uh, uh, project and rethink how can you address the same kind of uh, anthropological questions from a uh, different kind of uh, files or archives. Just to give you an example, one of my students wanted to work with indigenous courts and she wanted to do ethnography in these indigenous courts in the Maya area. Uh, it is very difficult that we will, that she will be able, the indigenous communities in many areas of Mexico are closing 
their communities to outsiders. And by August and September, to have somebody from Mexico City to go to a Maya community will be a risk. We don't know, we don't have a vaccine. We, so in that specific case, for example, we, we know that there were a lot of official documents uh, that were recognizing the uh, indigenous courts because we have a constitutional reform. And just before the pandemia, there was a series of big forums, state forums, to discuss in different indigenous areas uh, the constitutional changes and customary law. And those uh, forums were video recorded. And we are trying for her to have access to the forums and to analyze the discussions of the forums and about the legal changes and to discuss all the documents that were related with the constitutional. Of course, it's not the same thing that do ethnography of the trials, but it's related to the, the same question that it had. The question was mainly how the uh, state discourses were producing a new kind of uh, indigenous law in their exchange with uh, the practices, the local practices of justice, the capacity of production of a state legality. So the question could be the same, but the approach has to be different. But I think that in order to do those changes, it is very important for us as tutors, as professors, to go back to the, to the projects, to discuss together. And something that I think that is basic is to help the students get excited about the new strategies, to see this moment as a moment of opportunity. Because to start a PhD project, depressed and sad because you cannot do what you can do, what you want to do is gonna be a failure. So I think that we have a challenge. We have two therapists also. We have to go to the projects and they're relevant questions. They're great projects. You can approach them. Let's look how we can do that. Because if not, it's gonna be a gen the generation of COVID-19 that was totally depressed and couldn't do their dissertations. Yes, you are totally right, Ida. Does uh, Pam or, or Shiaki want to say something about this? You have to turn on your micro. Your micro. No, your micro is not on. Okay, uh, can I talk a bit? Sorry. Yes. It, it's a bit we a different uh, angle, but uh, I'm interested in when we can uh, when we can uh, go to feed again. And uh, as Ida also mentioned, that this is going to be a very a crisis for our discipline as anthropologists. But uh, for a younger researcher as I am. Uh, most uh, younger researchers in Japan are uh, getting their jobs as uh, teaching in fieldwork courses. So for us, it is, uh, I'm supposed to be teaching a uh, fieldwork method and uh, bringing a student to Canada or like uh, English speaking countries and uh, experience them, uh, having them experience a, a participant observation or interviews, but uh, all of these educational activities should be, uh, can be canceled for at least for a few years. So for me, it, it is also a job crisis uh, for a younger researcher like I am. But also, after the, this, uh, field, this uh, situation has changed and we might be able to go back to the field again, I'm very concerned about the uh, prejudice, uh, discrimination against East Asian uh, persons from the like, non-East Asian persons. And also, uh, some of my colleagues already uh, experienced uh, discrimination from the uh, population within the countries because they were in Europe uh, in February already. So some people were harassed by the, their neighbors or their relatives because they came back from uh, Spain or France. So I think I'm also, even though in this panel, many people are discussing about the, uh, how to go online or use online technology, but I also need to think about how, the, uh, if the situation gets better and we can go back to uh, this offline, like no regular research again, then we might also have to think about a different kind of uh, attitude towards yeah, East Asian people and East Asian researchers. And that's what I mean, thank you, nowadays. Yes, uh, yes, Shiaki, thank you so much. Did Pam want to say something? Because you were 
trying? Oh, no, uh, except to observe that what I've, certainly what I've heard is that uh, from colleagues is that um, all kind of non-essential, uh, that is sort of university PhD based projects um, in uh, remote communities. So in some, in some of the more um, sort of isolated communities, um, is certainly in the Northern Territory that that research won't, won't, communities won't allow that research to go ahead. I mean, that's, um, that's the reality is that students won't be able to propose and stand up um, projects that aren't deemed essential just because it's just too risky for, um, for um, vulnerable um, members of those populations. So the only uh, research that will be going ahead um, with those communities um, uh, is, will be in the context of um, a pro projects that the communities themselves deem to be essential. Okay, thank you very much, Pam. Uh, Ida wants to say something? Well, um, something that I was saying about the students that how can we see this as an opportunity? I was thinking, and Yaki was thinking about the new generations of young scholars that are competing in a very difficult academia that do not have tenure or in case of Mexico do not have definitive positions that I think that probably this give us an opportunity to make changes in our institutions that we need to make it is urgent because we it's, it's very interesting how we analyze inequality how we are so concerned about a structural power etc but our institutions have become neoliberal hubs in which uh, the young people are being stressed to death to be able to produce, 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 to get a tenure, to compete against each other, to not build community because you don't have time to build community because you have to publish or perish. And probably this is the post, we have to use this as an opportunity to build teams, intergenerational team, research teams, to support the younger scholars to do a different kind of research. The same thing that I say with the students, we have to uh, probably this is giving us an opportunity to stop because uh, what is interesting for me, I don't know how it's in each context is different, but Mexico has become so neoliberalized in the, in, in the academia. You have to publish in English, you have to get certain kind of journals to, be, so the kind, so we could not stop and organize because we have to be publishing and teaching and doing all those things. So now we stop and we are here for first time listening to my colleague from Japan who is suffering from xenophobia and who is a younger scholar. And so we have the chance to articulate and to make changes in our institutions. Thank you very much, Aida. I think you gave voice to what all of us were thinking that perhaps this pandemia with all its bad effects has some positive uh, effects, which is to make us all rethink um, our place and, and the way we can join efforts to, to change things in the world. And of course, in the academic world, um, very much so. Uh, okay, would, would, um, we've been here one and a half hour. Normally this is the time we give to the webinars because uh, more than, longer than one and a half hours, people, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. And I, I understand that for our colleagues in Australia and Japan, it's very late. I really apologize, but to, to have this online at the same time, there's no other way to do it. Uh, and we have, of course, huge time differences. So I really apologize and thank very much to our two colleagues in the, Eastern part of the world. But just to finish, uh, I know we've been discussing all this. I know there's a lot more to discuss and a lot of the issues that have come up on the chat and we've named and we've discussed some of them. Like I said, inequalities is of course a huge topic which needs to be addressed, but we have to think about this uh, with time. We want to, we intend to continue these webinars, but perhaps once every month, perhaps once every three months, we have to see how it works and have colleagues from uh, different countries and different anthropological associations participating. But just to wrap up, um, I would, um, I would, I don't know, perhaps really coming back to the topic of our students because that's very important. It's very important, like Ida said, and um, Daniel and, and, and Shiaki and Pamela to, to to encourage our students not to lose hope uh, if they cannot go to the field uh, at this time. And so perhaps, 
I don't know, perhaps in a, in a sentence you could sum up what do you would, um, advise students uh, to think or to do or to imagine? I don't know, just, uh, just an idea. Because I, I know some, a lot of them are, are, do, are here listening to us and, uh, and they need encouragement. And, and I think that's uh, uh, part of our duty to do it. Uh, okay, well, maybe I'll just say briefly that um, in the longer term, um, land councils in Australia, at least, are expecting uh, there to be a bottleneck around fieldwork as things return to normal when projects are going to have to be triaged. And, but there's going to be a lot of work to do. So if you're a student who's particularly interested in doing applied research, um, uh, in this kind of area, um, the work's not going away anytime soon. So, um, you know, um, stay interested and keep exploring opportunities. Thank you. Chiaki? Uh, or Ida, doesn't matter. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Chiaki. No, I mean, I, I can't really think of good advices now because I'm also struggling and uh, I just try to do what I have in my, uh, in, 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 uh, with me right now. So I try to go on Facebook as much as possible. It's probably, it, even though it's amateur anthropology, it's still tough on my eyes, but uh, I, I see what uh, I'm gonna uh, come up with uh, after maybe a, a year or two. Thank you so well, much, Ida. Well, I think that uh, this generation that is about to go to the field or that is in the field right now have the challenge to use creative tools and they will be remembered in 10 or 15 years as the generation of the COVID-19 and people will read what you did with a lot of uh, interest and admiration because you were the ones that confront the challenge in creative ways. So there are many things, as I said before, our ethnographic gaze, the way we read files, archives, newspapers, is the contributions that we can give. And as long as there is inequality and oppression and all those problems that we are confronting, as an anthropologist, we have something to contribute. So I don't feel discouraged. I'm sure that if you go back to your project, you will find a way to get this ethnographic gaze to a different kind of data, even if you don't go to this remote community where you were planning to go. Daniel? Uh, right, well, in terms of taking heart, I mean, I may have been, I'm in a slightly different position because I've been working as a digital anthropologist now for about 10 years, have supervised lots of PhDs, lots of projects that basically focus on the online world. And I would challenge anyone to suggest that these have been uh, lesser or less insightful um, than any traditional uh, anthropology. So this, we have a lot of experience in doing this. It has been done um, in exemplary ways. Um, I think you can learn from that. And one point I was going to follow what I said earlier um, is in terms of the positives, um, this is also about disseminating back to the world because our interaction into is, it doesn't finish with research. Um, we now concentrate on online as a way of getting our material back um, through blogging, through open access volumes, through free online uh, university courses. Um, I think that, that if this is recognized as opportunity, um, it does change our relationship, not only to our informants, um, but to the world that is interested in the findings of anthropology. And I think, yes, we should go for that. Well, thank you very much. I have a, a last appeal, which I know has been has been an issue here in Portugal, I'm sure in many countries, which is once again, the students, students who have uh, postdocs or who have uh, funding to do their research and are now strained and, and kept from doing their research is for us who have more a bit more power and are in positions in universities or institutions to really make the funders, the, the different institutions that fund the projects, to postpone the, the scholarships so that the students can really profit and use uh, their funds later when they can go to the field, especially those who cannot do their work right now. And I think this is very important to do with the funding agencies in each country. Um, so 
I want to thank you all very much, uh, Shiaki, Pamela, Ada, Daniel, but also I want to thank everyone who's been participating actively in the chat, uh, writing their comments, their questions, um, and uh, it has been really uh, interesting to discuss this, and we hope to continue with the webinars, and um, thank you very, very much for attending, and remember that this will be available online in the WOW WCA website, and you are welcome to go and look at it. Uh, any time probably from me in a few hours on uh, not not pro it's probably not available right now but it will be in a few hours okay thank you very very much and see you in the next webinar